Next, we'll let you in on the latest wave of security in Hollywood. JFK and Abraham Lincoln and show you film footage from Canada of an actual UFO. But first, the 1915 UFO. The month was August, the site Gallipoli in Western Turkey. A fierce battle was raging between Turks on the one hand and a combined force of British, Australian and New Zealand troops on the other. It was one of the worst cases of trench warfare in history. August 28, 1915 dawned clear and cloudless, another day in the bitter campaign. A company of infantrymen from New Zealand had captured one of the hills overlooking the battlefield. They noticed something very unusual in the valley. Several clouds, huge clouds, in the shape of loaves of bread hovering above the valley floor. And also one very large one sitting on the floor of the valley. It was 800 feet long, 200 feet wide, and 200 feet high. Then they noticed a British regiment, the 1st 4th of Norfolk, start to march through it. That regiment never emerged from the cloud. The New Zealanders reported that once the entire regiment had been swallowed up by the cloud, it started to rise slowly from the ground and join the other clouds in formation until they all ascended out of the valley and into the sky toward Bulgaria, taking the regiment with them. After the end of the war in 1918, the British demanded the return of their troops. The Turks angrily responded that they never engaged them in battle, that they neither captured nor executed them. Indeed, some Turkish soldiers said they witnessed the same thing that the Anzac troops had, namely, the British troops being engulfed by the cloud. So what's the answer? Well, just conceivably, these clouds were actually UFOs from an advanced society, a society able to actually enshroud their spacecraft in what appear to be clouds to us. A true mystery from the 20th century for your consideration. Now, when we return, all about Mokeli Membe, Africa's living dinosaur. Please stay tuned. What's your favorite? Welcome back. Since the 1800s in Central Africa, pygmies living there have described a monster they call Mokeli Membi, a swamp creature said to be enormous in size, part elephant, part dragon. Mokeli Membi has been avoiding hunters and explorers since the beginning of the 20th century, and reports of its existence date back to the 1800s. In the early 1980s, Dr. Roy Mackle of the University of Chicago undertook a series of expeditions into the trackless jungles and swamps to hunt down this critter. Mackle uncovered Mokomembe's tracks. He discovered huge footprints that led to a river about the size of an elephant's tracks. But the flattened vegetation around them suggested that the trail had been made by something reptilian, taller and larger than any crocodile. Mackle collected many eyewitness accounts from the natives concerning Mokeli Membi. They said he was a friendly plant eater, that he never attacked a human. Indeed, when humans attacked him, he would take refuge deep into the swampland that was his home. He showed them sketches and photos of creatures from all eras. Every native picked out this fellow right here, the Brachiosaurus, a giant plant-eating dinosaur who lived millions of years ago. One problem, Mokeli Membi is about 30 to 32 feet long. Brachiosaurus 60 feet or longer. Perhaps Mokeli Membi is simply a young Brachiosaurus or a subspecies. Unfortunately, the only Mokeli Membi ever captured was eaten for dinner by the pygmies. Imagine that, the greatest discovery in the history of paleontology in the bellies of pygmy natives. Recently, a new expedition was launched by Bill Gibbons from England he's determined to find Mokeli Membi. Any reports, and you'll hear them first on our show, Mysteries from Beyond the Other Dominion. Now for the case of California's traveling dead man. The dateline, February 1st, 1963, 2 p.m. Attorney Thomas Meehan is feeling a bit under the weather 
as he begins his drive home from Eureka, California to Concord. By 5 p.m., he feels too ill to make the rest of the trip. He checks into the 40 Winks Motel at the town of Redway and drives himself to the Southern Humboldt Community Hospital to see a doctor. He sits in the waiting room for 45 minutes until a nurse approaches him to take his history. He tells her that he feels as though he were dead. At 6.45, the nurse starts to fill out papers on him. She looks down. Next time she looks up, he's vanished. 7 p.m., Mr. and Mrs. Martin report an accident to the State Highway Patrol. They have just seen the tail lights of a speeding car vanish on Highway 101, apparently plunging into the rolling waters of the Eel River. The state police immediately dispatch a car to the scene. At 8 p.m., he's back at the 40 Winks Motel. The owner, Chip Nunamaker, has a long conversation with Meehan, in which Meehan keeps asking him whether he looks as though he were dead. Nunamaker thinks Meehan looks fine, although he notices that his shoes and trouser cuffs are mysteriously wet and muddy. 9.30 p.m., Nunamaker goes to Meehan's room to tell him that the call Meehan has tried to put through to his wife cannot be completed because a storm has disrupted service. Nunamaker notices that Meehan is dressed now in a black suit and white tie. No more wet cuffs or muddy shoes. He's the last person on this planet to have seen me in a lot. At 10.45, the highway patrol finds Mian's car in the Eel River. The car is empty, and a trail of bloody footprints lead up the bank and toward the road. But Mian is not at the Forty Winks Motel. His suitcase is there, as are his clothes, but there is no sign of the man himself. He wasn't found until 19 days later, when his body surfaced 16 miles downriver from the spot where his car had plunged into the river. An autopsy showed that Meehan didn't die in the crash, but that he was injured and possibly drowned, stumbling out of the car, trying to find his way back to safety. There are several unanswered questions regarding this case. For example, did Meehan have a premonition that he was going to die, perhaps as early as 2 p.m. in the afternoon? Did he return as a ghost to the motel? Well, this case may actually represent a true rarity in parapsychology, a combined premonition ghost case. In other words, he knew he was going to die, and at 6.45, he left the hospital because he knew he had a rendezvous with the Grim Reaper. After his death, he may have left his body as a spirit and returned to the motel being seen by at least two people. Truly one of the most intriguing cases in the annals of the paranormal. Turning now to Dr. Rule's realm of strange coincidence and the striking parallels between the lives of JFK and Abraham Lincoln. Of course, both men were ardent civil rights advocates. Both men were assassinated in the presence of their wives. Both men were assassinated on a Friday. And both men were assassinated through a bullet in their heads. For more parallels, we sent our roving reporter Dennis down to Dallas Take it away, Dennis. Thank you, Dr. Rule. I'm now in Dallas, Texas, and behind me is the infamous Grassy Knoll. On November 22nd, 1963, on this very spot, John F. Kennedy was shot. Now we're all familiar with the controversy involving who did it or how many people were involved, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to examine the similarities between this assassination and the one of Abraham Lincoln nearly a hundred years earlier. Now the facts here are quite astounding. Let's take a look. First of all, the time period of 100 years comes up several times. Lincoln was elected president in 1860, while Kennedy was elected in 1960. Their successors, who were both named Johnson, by the way, were born in 1808 and 1908, respectively. Then, to top it all off, John Wilkes Booth was born in 1839, while Lee Harvey Oswald, yes, you guessed it, was born in 1939. Yes, you guessed it, that's the famous sixth floor of the Book Depository. Now listen to these facts. First of all, Lincoln's secretary, whose name was Kennedy, advised him not to go to the theater that night. While Kennedy's secretary, whose name was Lincoln, advised him not to go to Dallas. Furthermore, 
When John Wilkes Booth shot Lincoln in the theater, he ran to a warehouse to hide. And when Lee Harvey Oswald shot Kennedy from a warehouse, he ran to a theater to hide. Isn't that bizarre? Finally, there's this interesting tidbit. Both the names Kennedy and Lincoln contain seven letters. Their successors, Andrew Johnson and Lyndon Johnson, contain 13 letters. And then, amazingly, John Wilkes Booth and Lee Harvey Oswald contain 15 letters. Astounding. Thank you very much, Dennis, for yet another excellent report. And there's still one other similarity between the two presidents. Lincoln was assassinated in the Ford Theater. Kennedy was assassinated in a Lincoln, a Ford automobile. How about that? Next up, the amazing case of Texas John Slaughter and his guardian angel. Please stay tuned. Welcome back. Time now for Texas John Slaughter. But first, the trivia question of the day. Let me extricate it here from its paper prison. The question, which actor portrayed Texas John Slaughter in a 1959 TV series? A big hint. He was the monster in the sci-fi classic, I Married a Monster from Outer Space. Now the prize, the only prize is one pat on the back that you'll have to administer to yourself if and only if you get the correct answer. I'll take a sip of water and be back momentarily. Okay, I'm calling time. That actor was Tom Tryon, who later went on to become a successful author. Unfortunately, he recently passed away. Now, after Wyatt Earp left Tombstone Territory following the infamous gunfight at the OK Corral, lawlessness started to prevail once again in Tombstone Territory. So, a rancher named Texas John Slaughter, who was actually an Arizonan, decided to take over as sheriff. Now, he wasn't a quick draw artist as we see in the movies. His weapon of choice, the sure shotgun. He made many enemies with it, but he also had another ally. It was a guardian angel who told him that any time he buzzed in his ear, that was a sign that danger was ahead and he'd better heed that warning. As long as he heeded those warnings, the guardian angel guaranteed that he would die a peaceful death in bed. Now let's look at two examples of how that guardian angel saved his life. In one instance, he and his wife were coming back from a dance one night. He was at the range of the buckboard as they were traveling home and suddenly he heard that mysterious buzzing sound in his ear. He stopped the buckboard and while his wife took over the reins, Texas John pulled out his shotgun. Sure enough, there was a rider, a bushwhacker just ahead who took off when he saw the shotgun. Texas John's life was saved. In another instance, he was sitting at the breakfast table reading a newspaper with his back to an open window. He again heard that characteristic buzzing in his ear. He got down on the floor. Moments later, two shots rang out and came right through that window. Apparently, a disgruntled ranch hand had killed the foreman and had taken some shots at Texas John. This was in 1921. Again, his life was saved. As promised by the guardian angel, Texas John did die a peaceful death in bed the very next year, 1922. Now for some amazing facts about chameleons. The true chameleon is basically native to Africa and he looks truly prehistoric. The chameleon has virtually no neck so it cannot move its head from side to side. Instead, it has two independent eyes and turrets that can each move independent of the other. He has an unusual tail. It's a prehensile tail that allows himself to coil himself around a twig and remain in place all day. In addition, he has unusual paws. Both forepaws and hind paws have two sets of toes. Three toes on each foot and paw, point forward, three backward, that allows him to grasp objects such as limbs very tenaciously. Additionally, 
He has an unusual tongue. That's how he kills his prey. He shoots it out like a harpoon, digging it into insects. He reels in that prey and eats it whole. One thought is that at the tip of the tongue is something sticky. Another thought is that they may be small grappling hooks that dig into the creature, or conceivably it's a combination of both of those, but he's a very efficient insectivore. He also changes color. That's what he's noted most for, but not because of his environment. It's more because of temperature changes, light changes, or his mood. For example, when he's very angry, he'll turn jet black. When he's in combat with another chameleon, he'll turn dark green. When he's at rest, light green. Chameleons are truly amazing creatures, aren't they? Time now for the world of bizarre medicine. As you know, I'm a PhD, not an MD, but I've always been intrigued by the world of bizarre medicine. Let's see what's in the little black bag today. Aha, an ear. This reminds me of a recent case that took place on October 4th, 1991. In England, in a barroom brawl, a man was in a fight and his adversary actually bit off his ear. He was rushed to the Queen Victoria Hospital. They were able to save the ear, but they could not immediately reattach it to his head. So to keep it well nourished with blood, they attached it to his thigh. Now in February 1992, they tried to contact him because they felt the ear could now be reattached to his head. He could not be found anywhere. So today, somewhere in England, there's a man wandering around with his ear attached to his thigh. In another case, 1990, in Yugoslavia, a man accidentally had his hand severed. It was reattached to his chest. And then yet another case in France, 1991, a man accidentally lost his foot. It was attached to his arm. Now that's what I call bizarre. When we return, film footage of a UFO from Canada. Stay tuned. Don't go away. Welcome back. Time now for that film footage of a UFO from up in Canada. It was shot by an anonymous cameraman over Carp Lake in Ontario, Canada. Please note, there's a mysterious ring of fire on the right-hand side. Possibly a second UFO recently disengaged from the first UFO. Let's take a look. Roll tape. Our cameraman walks to the edge of the ravine. Below you can see a cylindrical object with a very bright light underneath illuminating the surrounding area. On top of the object is a strobing beacon. To its right side is either a flare pattern or the afterburn marks of a recently ascended UFO. This tape has been brought to various experts for analysis. Strangely enough, it has not been determined to be a fake. A very weird sight. Unfortunately, our cameraman runs out of tape before observing the liftoff. Very intriguing. Now, if you should have some UFO film footage or a shot of a Bigfoot creature, ghost, or lake monster, please call us on our toll-free 800 number. That's 1-800-45-RULE, R-U-E-H-L. If we use anything you send us, you may achieve a small measure of fame. And that's a lot better than a slap on the belly with a wet trout. Now, until next time, may the power of the universe be with you, be with you, be with you, be with you. Be with you.